This is Carte Blanche, the podcast. One story every day that matters. Delve into the issues that impact you. Whether you're in need of a better understanding of the world around you or simply seeking inspiration or unique perspectives, you'll find it all here. Ethical leadership, releasing the land to the people and setting up a food security council in the Free State. These are just some of the things independent candidate Sissing Ramatswabudi is putting on the table to convince voters to give him a chance. But running for office is a daunting task and the challenges are many, even for the biggest political parties out there. Masa Kekana finds out why Sissing thinks he stands a chance. Welcome to another installment of Cod Blanche, the podcast, Elections Unpacked with myself, Masa Gegana. It is crunch time. The pressure is on. So today I'm excited to be talking to a person whose face will be appearing on the ballot for the very first time, running as an independent candidate. Today I'll be talking to Sisseng Ramutuabudi. What I think is very exciting, Sisseng, about these elections is that history will be made because you will be one of the 11 independent candidates. Firstly, welcome to you. How are you feeling? Yeah, I, I don't know how I feel because I don't know if, if I feel nervous or excited or scared or I don't know. I mean, I've had probably <laughs> six hours of sleep this whole week. Let's maybe ask the question, what motivated you? And maybe if you could tell us a little bit about who you are and what made you lead to this decision. I'm from Sasselberg, born and bred in the Free State in Sasselberg an industrial town where, where options are limited. Either you grow up and work in the industrial area, your other option is literally going into agriculture or you know, becoming a teacher or a nurse. So I decided to opt for marketing and I ended up in the media space. I studied and then interned at YFM, interned at Black Rage Productions, worked at MTV Base when they launched the first Africa Music Awards, worked with a number of artists as well from H2O, Squatter Camp, end up working on TV for Red Pepper Pictures and end up on radio as well, Metro FM, SABC, Radio 2000. But in the background, growing up in Zamdela, you almost become part of politics without even joining a political party. For example, I grew up at my grandmother's house, which is right opposite a, a hostel. Hostels are known for having people from different areas, people from Eastern Cape, from KZN. But growing up in that period, obviously there was political tension between the Zulu-speaking people, Kosa people, and us, the speaking people in the township because of the Inkata issues. But our parents did what they could to maybe give us slightly better opportunities than they had. So they took me to a school in front of Bell Park, which is literally like 15 minutes away, 20 minutes away from home. But what was interesting about going to school in front of Bell was that they interacted with kids from civil game from Shabville, from Vipatong. So at that same time, you have family members that are involved in politics. My older brother was with the PAC. My other brother was with the ANC and he, he continued until he, he passed away last year because, I mean, he became a, an influential figure even at national level. So we became members of the ANC without literally knowing that we are joining. But having proximity gives you a different perspective. You get to see what's promised to people versus what's delivered. You're privileged to information that ordinary people wouldn't have, uh, would, wouldn't be privy to. And that changed my perspective. It made me want to do things in a different way because the liberation movement talks about the renewal project, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, listening to your conscience, but you don't see that happening. I mean, where I'm from, public health has totally collapsed. Local municipality is completely collapsed. There is no water in the township. There's asbestos roofs everywhere. The elders are getting sick because of this asbestos thing, but yet all these things are budgeted for. The the crazy thing is that the MEC of Cocta is actually from my ward. Like his house is a few streets from my house. And he sees these things and he still returns 600 million rand back to the provincial treasury. I mean, you're the MEC of Cocta. Your own house, your neighbors have asbestos. You've got the budget to actually fix it, but you're returning that money back to the national treasury. There's clearly a disconnect between people that we've elected to bring change to our lives and ordinary people. 
And that disconnect mm. didn't make sense to me. How difficult of a decision was that for you, Sasein? Because your background in media, broadcasting, music, really creative, the art space. You mentioned YFM, Squatter Camp, MTV, all relatively fun and young organizations and institutions. Would you say you are ready to move from that world into what we all know is the dirty world of politics, particularly as an independent when you don't have the muscle and the resources of a political party that's established? that's backing you? I'd say I am because I, I don't think the switch is that uh, hectic because I've been doing ANC work my whole life. We've been carrying posters, putting post- posters on the wall. We've been involved with mobilization ever since we were kids. We didn't even know we were doing ANC work. That's how it naturally came to us. So it wasn't a difficult switch, but it was, it was probably difficult for the people that know me as a member because, I mean, my family has received threats. They've been sworn at. Oh, because the... you're contesting for the elections? Yeah. You've been called a traitor. So it's almost a level of disbelief that I want to do things different outside the organization. You know, every single family member of mine that I run into or that gives me a call tell me that the comrades were here during a door-to-door. And they said, well, we should tell you that they're going to deal with you after the elections. So it's been a whole month of intimidation. And it's okay. Why put yourself in that position? It sounds daunting and scary. Why put yourself in that position? Why is it so important to you? It's important because we need to see this change. Change is important. I don't think I've achieved everything that I want to achieve in life, but I'm doing my ultimate best to try and show that my kids have a better future than I have. And I can do what I can at home, but they're not going to live inside the house every day of their lives. They need to go out there in society. So we need to play a role. I felt it was my responsibility to play a role to ensure that my kids grow up in a better society. They grow up in a safe environment. They grow up in a, in a free state where they can freely use public hospitals and they'll get the treatment they deserve. They live in an area where there are no asbestos roofs, where, where there are no water shortages. So those are the things that motivated me to actually want to do this. And Even the the basics like the collapse of the township economy, whereby the township tax shops are all gone and they're owned by foreign nationals. Some are undocumented. All these things. But also also that sounds like Action SA's concerns, but that's also in their policies. Did you not see yourself maybe perhaps joining a party that you feel is aligned to what you believe in? I felt that a lot of the parties, manifestos, and ideology is still around. Uh, there's elements of the ANC around. And I, I didn't want to be in that space. I mean, you look at the seven cardinal pillars of the EFF, you could literally pull them out of the Freedom Charter. So it's, for me, all these political parties almost look the same. And organizations like the Action SAs, the Rising Zans, I felt that, that they were compromised because of the people that are funding them. So I decided, let me just rather do this on my own and see how far it gets. Um, And I want us to talk about funding because I know that's a a big challenge as well. But while we're on this topic, what is it that you believe in? What are your policies? I'm proposing a reform, a reform in public health, a reform in the way local government is ran, a reform in immigration policy, a reform in, in support of small businesses and a reform just when it comes to the way government is dealing with the issue of unemployment. Complete reform. Because Do you think as an independent, you'll have enough power to be able to effect that kind of change? I think every voice counts. I must make sense to somebody in the event that we make it into in, in, into the provincial government. I believe that I will make sense to somebody. And the thing is, with the challenges that we are facing, I mean, these are issues that, that affect everyone. I think everybody, a lot of the people that that, that I'm talking about, they relate to to the current challenges that I'm talking about. And they know these things. It's just that they want to use them in a way that will benefit them. I got a text just before our interview from an, an MP, a member of parliament in Namibia, and she was commenting on something that I posted on my stories, on my WhatsApp stories, because I posted the story of the lady that just received 17 million rand from the Mbopa government for negligence. And she's a foreigner and she was on TV with the MEC of Health. And she asked me something crazy. I mean, I can read you the message. It's, and she said to me, I find the South African public health system in relation to its immigration approach very difficult to understand. In Namibia, 
Foreigners must prove legality as per Immigration Act and must pay for any treatment received in a public hospital because these public goods are designed for the privilege of citizens who enjoy preference and don't need to pay for such services. It seems that in South Africa, there is not any clear policy direction when it comes to immigration. And this trickles into an overburdened healthcare system and obviously other public goods. And I agree with her 100%. So uh, what are your focus factors? Would your focus factors be on foreign nationals in the country? Well, it starts in the province. It starts at home. It it starts with tightening the systems at home in in the province, hopefully through other independents, because that's some of the discussions that we've had with other independents, that whatever issues that we have at provinces, they can amplify them at national level. So th- that will be one of my issues, the complete reform of our, of our immigration system, including the treaties that we've signed, whereby you find that some of those treaties have tangled us the way we are. The Minister Mitsualedi was, was talking about the refugee treaty that we signed. I don't have the details around it, but it seems that anyone can jump our border, end up at a public facility and claim to be a refugee, and our government will have no choice but to assist them. It makes no sense. The public systems are for South Africans first. Even though we don't live by ourselves in the continent, there has to be a system in a way that you're able to prove that someone is a refugee. And we cannot turn our people away. We understand that even for this country to get its liberation, it's not something that we did on our own. We had assistance from other countries, but there has to be a functioning immigration system that works for everybody. Apart from immigration, what else are you proposing? I I spoke about public health, and Mm. I know the government has introduced the NHI, which is a game changer in the sense that it's going to equal the playing field in terms of public health. But I don't know, I don't see it working in the free state, to be honest with you, because you have a system in the free state whereby, for example, the free state health every year, I mean, this year alone, is paying 5 billion rand in civil claims. And last year, they paid 4 billion rand in civil claims. It shows you that there's a bigger problem here because it just means that there aren't any monitoring evaluation systems just to enhance service delivery and accountability. It says to you, there's a serious HR crisis whereby the people that are actually working there need some sort of a training program to address the skills gap. How do you injure that many people? Almost 3,000 babies die every year at free state hospitals. There's no accountability. So it shows you there's a big problem, that the workforce needs to be developed. You get told that at the clinics around the province that they don't have medication. It makes no sense. That medication was budgeted for. So it means also there's a supply chain issue. I mean, right now, according to the Auditor General, almost 80% of clinics in the free state do not meet the clinic status. That's a problem. Now, how are you going to implement NHI? You're simply going to burden the private health system. But with, mm-hmm. with that said, the government keeps lying and saying that you're going to be able to walk into any, any private health care of your choice in the province. It's not true. Because when you go through the NHI, it clearly states that you can only walk into a facility closest to you. If there's a clinic down the road from my house that doesn't meet the bare minimum clinic status, how is NHI going to help me? Also, the problems of the free state in particular are also very well documented. Yeah. And you were saying earlier that you will make sense to somebody. Basically, you will have a constituency and some of the things you're saying will ring to somebody out there. But yeah. if we're being realistic, politics is also a numbers game. Many people are saying that independent candidates are kind of overestimating the influence that you could have. How would you respond to that? I don't think so. I think our democracy is at a place where nobody, probably for the next 20 years or three administrations, is ever going to get complete majority. I don't see that happening. You look at the last local elections in the Free State 2021, when you put together all the numbers across the province, the ANC got exactly 50% in the province. So it shows you the trend. So either way, whoever, whether it's ANC, EFF or DA, they have to work with somebody. You'll be very lucky for the ANC to get 51% in the province. If they get it now, they definitely won't get it in the next election. And th- that era, the period where anyone can have an outright majority and do as they please is gone. You're going to have to work with people. Obviously, with the exception of your like Eastern Capes, and those people still have a long way to go. But as far as free state is concerned, there is no way anyone is going to be able to run this province on their own.
And that's where our voices come in. Coalitions will be the order of the day, as we know. And as you're speaking, you're going to have to work with someone. Who would you be willing to enter into a coalition with? Look, it'll have to be anyone that's making sense at that moment. We know why we are where we are at the moment. We know the problems that we are in are simply because of cater deployment. I mean, you get this information from the auditors report, which talks about maladministration. So we know why we're here. At the same time, just growing up in, in the free state, just understanding the racial dynamics, it's a very difficult thing to do to simply hand over a vote to a Freedom Front, for example. I don't think they've done enough to show just the people of South Africa that they are for all South Africans instead of just being prioritizing the interests of the African nation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it would be very difficult for me to vote with someone like that. However, once everybody sits down and we sit around the table with the different players and we all agree on what we'd like to see happen in the province, I think that will determine where we go. I met one of the national leaders of, I can't say the name of the organization, but it's one of the biggest organizations in the country. And we started discussing, I mean, they came early and they said to me, look, man, we can see where this thing is going. What's your position on such and such and such and such an issue? And funny enough, we, we shared similar views on a lot of issues. We just differed when it came to Palestine and Israel. And I think, we, I, I think everybody knows who I'm talking about. But other than that, our interests... Tell us who you're talking about. Tell us who you're talking about. You've already <laughs> put out too many clues. You may as well say it. Yeah, but I mean, it was... It was I wouldn't say it was an official meeting, but it was a discussion. Talks are being had. We do know that. And we do know that these are just talks. They're not gentlemen's agreements. They're not contracts. They're just talks at this stage. So that conversation you had, who was that with? And who are the other people that you are talking to that are sort of making sense to you? So at the end of the discussion, the gentleman said to me, it was very important for them as an organization to know that I'm someone they can talk to. And the other people that we've had conversations with, other smaller parties are like new players, but left players. So we've had discussions with them. But what I'm literally avoiding in all conversations is the distribution of power, because that seems to be the direction some of the smaller parties are taking. I don't want to have those sort of discussions where you're already discussing that you're going to be an MEC of what would when if something, something happens. I mean, that's, that's not the reason why I'm there. And I think that's often the case why you see coalition governments not working at local level because people are in it more for positions that I'm going to look after this portfolio, which has an X amount of budget, and then I can dictate where the tenders go. That's not the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I have not committed to anyone, but I said I listened, I contributed, they know my position, and I, I left it at that. I mean, they were not happy. Because I don't know what the understanding was when they had a conversation before talking to me that I'll be excited by being offered at a position when we have not even gone to the elections. It makes no sense. Let's get through the elections and then we can start having those discussions afterwards. But it's about the people. It's about ensuring that the life of the people of the free state changes. We have a functioning local government. We have a functioning public sector. We have a functioning economy, we we get young people employed, we take advantage of what we have in the free state. Because, I mean, free state is an agricultural province, so we need to leverage it. I mean, for example, now there's been a discovery of helium in the province. We need to ensure that there is a way in which the province leverages the people of the free state, the discovery of helium. So it's things like that that speak to me. I'm not interested in having conversations about cater deployment, that when we come in there, we're going to appoint this person to that municipality, we're going to do this and that. For me, that, that's a bit too early, you know? Unlike perhaps an Anilam Da, I mean, she's the only well-known independent, apart from Zaki Ahmad. For you guys who are novices in politics, it must be very difficult as well, because South Africans have a trust deficit when it comes to politicians for right reasons. So... How difficult is it for you to convince a voter that, look, I'm just saying I'm a good guy. I'm not there for catered deployment. I'm not there for the positions. I'm just there for the work and to make this province a better place. How do you go about doing that? It's about being relatable. It's about talking about the problems that every resident of the free state, every challenge they go through. And so far, we seem to be aligned because the jobs issue is, is a problem for everyone in the free state. The education issue 
is a problem for everyone in the free state, even though, for example, you see that the free state matriculants take the first spot every year. But there's deeper educational problems in the free state. For example, right now, and this is a problem that a lot of the middle class in the free state are going through, unemployment levels are skyrocketing in the free state. But you almost have these Model C schools that are in the free state or the schools in inverted commas that are in town. They've gone it's almost as if they, they form some sort of a cartel whereby they've decided to approach certain law firms and they've literally gone to repossess furniture of parents across the province that can afford to pay school fees. The story was even on Newsroom Africa, and that's happening in every single town in the free state. So that's a relatable problem. When you talk about the support of small businesses, everybody in the free state understands it, that there isn't enough support. You talk about the healthcare crisis in the free state, everybody understands because they go to these hospitals and they go through the challenges that I'm talking about. When you talk about immigration, they know that in every street or every second street, there's a tax shop that's been run by people from Pakistanis or Ethiopians. So our people know about these things. They can relate to them. But what speaks to me as a most important in the free state, I really want to establish that the Food Security Council, because a lot of people go to bed hungry in the free state because of unemployment and many other reasons. So for me, that's one of the top problems I want to fix. I want to sort out the hunger issue in the free state. It's personal. It's, it's, it's very close to my heart and the issue of land. But other things like obviously the decentralization in the province, you still have the economy concentrated in a particular place in the free state. The entire economy is you're either in Sasselberg because Sassel and other industries are there or you're in Mangaung because it's a metro. But everywhere else, there are no jobs. So people are scattered. They all move to these two places. But those that can't move stay there in those rural areas and there's no food, there's no employment. I was in a small town called Kestel. I went to another one called Paul Leroux. I went to another one called Winbeck on your way to Bloemfontein. Masa, do you know that in those towns, right, the only employer available in that area, it's either you're a teacher, either you work for government or you work at a, at a farm slightly outside. There is no economic activity. Either you're a teacher, a cop, a nurse, or you work at the library or you work at the clinic or you work just outside town at someone's farm. You're a cherry picker or something or you pick, I don't know, maize or whatever. There, there isn't economic activity in the free state. I mean, that makes no sense. Why the... The province hasn't tried spreading the economy around. And you look at the land they're working. They're working for people that are not even willing to share some of those profits with them, which is a much bigger issue. It becomes a land issue. I mean, from a provincial point of view, realistically speaking, when it comes to the land issue, for instance, the powers really land and vest in national government. So for now, practically speaking... How would you be able to resolve those problems? You start by releasing land owned by the provincial government. You release land owned by the municipalities. That, that's where you start. It, it, it's not like a local government doesn't own land. It's not like provincial government doesn't own land. So you start by releasing that land. After you release that land, you motivate for economic activity, whether it's small-scale farming or small-scale mining or someone that wants to get into property or someone that wants to build a road. It doesn't matter what economic activity people want to get into as, as soon as they receive the land, but they need to receive the support they need in order for them to create employment in those areas. To people who say voting for an independent would be a wasted vote, what do you feel? Every vote counts. It's, it's not a wasted voice. You always need an alternative voice in everything that you do. It, it's very important. Every voice counts. If things were working the way they are at the moment, you wouldn't need us. But currently, Things do not work. That's why we're here. You will be the first independent candidate to go down in the history books. So already that is an achievement in itself. But campaigning is also very expensive. And just running for an election is also very expensive. There's been a lot of challenges. But when it comes to funding, how challenging has it been for you? Very challenging. And there's been a lot of lessons. I've come across two types of donors, right? There's a donor that says to me, I'm willing to support you. However, when you get in there, you need to guarantee me business that you're going to pass some tenders my way. I cannot do that. So I've lost donations from those type of donors. The other type of donor is the policy donor, you know, who I thought maybe would make sense. But the policy donors are people that are pushing for policies that 
I personally don't agree with. Like what? So, for example, I did a presentation for a group of farmers and they wanted to push an issue of farm murders and some of their conditions did not make sense to me. They wanted it to be declared that farm murders should be declared as a genocide. But they wanted the exchange for their money was for me to, every time I go to provincial government, to push that message as much as I can and bring attention to it. And I said to them, look, crime is crime everywhere. There's crime in every sector of society. I personally, looking at the numbers, don't think that there's a group of black people who are sitting somewhere that have decided that they're going to kill every farmer in the province. I don't think that's true. So those are the sort of things they wanted us, well, by us, I mean the people that I work with, to go and push for a, a provincial government. Another donor I met in Paris, nice gentleman, we spoke, very wealthy, as hectares of land. And in the end, after I thought I'd made a great presentation, he asked me where I stand when it comes to the Palestine-Israel issue. And I told him, I, I stand with the full support of the South African government with this one. And he called me a Palestine sympathizer and I lost his donation. So there's a lot of lessons that come with maybe... I don't know, maybe I'm not experienced enough yet to negotiate with donors because I don't know how you would walk into someone's room, get money and not push whatever agenda they want. Particularly with the independence, because the story that we aired on carte blanche this past Sunday as well on independence, that was a challenge for Tepo Mohano as well as Anna Limda, having the right donors, donors who are saying go into the legislature or the National Assembly and punt my views and they had to turn down a lot of money. But in turning down a lot of money, that also means that you need to dig into your own pockets. Now, that is a sacrifice that I think many of us as South Africans aren't recognizing. Would I, as Masa Kegana, take my own savings, leave my job to go and put it into this, which people are calling a possible wasted vote, to go into a world where my family and myself get threats, like you you have said, and to go into a world where I don't have any more money. And I think that is a sacrifice that all 11 candidates deserve applause for, even though I'm still battling to see how a single voice is going to make the changes that you are calling for. We can't wait for a perfect day when there's a group of people to push change. Somebody needs to start. When you want change, you need to be the change that you want to see. It starts with you. And hopefully your voice will grow. It will reach as many people as possible to help bring change. I could simply sit at home and be in the comfort of having proximity to people in the ANC. Hopefully I'll get tenders or whatever. But What's that going to do for the rest of the country? I don't want to live in a society where it's evident that equality is evident, where there's unequal levels of education, unequal health care, unequal standards of living. I'm not going to live forever, but I want my kids to, to live in, a, in an inclusive society which, which has fair chances for everyone. We have a fair chance of making it, whether through the education system or through the health system. So we do live in an an equal society. So we just need to do our part to level the playing field. And someone has to talk about it, whether it's from an independent point of view or from a political point of view. But it's been 30 years. They have failed. Two days ago, I was looking at salaries of mining bosses. And it made no sense to me that in the kind of economy that we live in, there is someone out there that earns 600,000 rand a day. It makes no sense. The people working those months should have a share of those profits. It just showed you the level of inequality that there is in the country. You look at the top five earners in the mining sector. If you want to bring race into it, all top five of them are white CEOs. There's no black CEO that earns over 100,000 rand a day in, in the mining sector. To even talk about such numbers a day is ridiculous. So somebody needs to stand up. Uh, and, and, and talk about equality and try to bring change. And you can only start at home. Start where you are, you clean your yard, you, you do your bed. It starts with the little things. Mm. And hopefully the, 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 the spirit of change will, will filter into society, it will filter into government and possibly the whole country. In one line, vote for me, Mr. Singh, because... Vote for me because... 
when you vote for us, you, you're voting for ethical leadership. You're voting for people that have an unbiased approach and have no party affiliation. You're voting for accountability. You're voting for new leadership. You're voting for people that have a fresh perspective and a desire to make a difference in this kind. The old guys, I mean, we thank them for their contribution. But age is a real thing. We need to make space for younger leadership, younger, different perspective, different thinking, fresh idea. It makes no sense that you have people that are 70 years, 80 years old, and I don't want to sound like an ageist, but that are making decisions for a future that they're not going to be a part of. So we need younger leadership. We need a fresh perspective. We need different thinking. We need accountability, most important. Thank you so much for joining us on our Elections Unpacked podcast. Please do stay safe. Those death threats sound very serious. So please do take care of yourself and all the best. Thank you very much. Be sure to follow Carte Blanche, the podcast, to ensure you don't miss any of our election coverage in the weeks to come. And if you have a story to share with our team, why not head on over to the Carte Blanche website and let us know using the Tip Us Off page.